What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Variant the Podcast. Before we dive in, though, we want to let all of you know that the video format for the podcast is only going to be living on our Variant the Podcast YouTube channel. So That's if you're, right. If you're watching this, you clearly already know that. But if you're listening and you want to watch it, you have to go to our Variant uh, the Podcast YouTube channel, then subscribe, and you'll get this every week, uh, just like the audio version. Yeah, so. and the links for that will be in the description of the actual podcast episode, whether you're watching on or listening, rather, on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever it is, you'll find that in the description. Correct. So go there, subscribe, and uh, you can also check out our lovely faces. Yeah. Now, I've, I want to get right into it because I've been pondering about the Morbius trailer for a while. Not necessarily the trailer itself, but the massive reveal that happened at the end of the trailer. Yeah. But I have a lot to say about the end of the trailer and that reveal. But first, I guess I guess we could just give our thoughts on the trailer itself. Uh, as far as the trailer itself, I thought it was okay. I didn't think it was absolutely terrible. I mean, you know, I like the Morbius character. Um, I didn't necessarily think he, you know, should get a standalone movie, although I do like vampire mm -hmm. movies and stuff. I think it's probably going to be along the lines of, like, the Underworld movies and Blade movies where they kind of got mixed reactions, you know, where, yeah. like, the Blade the Blade trilogy and the Underworld films, those are some of, like, my favorite movies as far as fun. Like, I really enjoy watching them. Now, I understand they're not, like, these critically acclaimed, like, Oscar-worthy movies, but they have big followings. They're just fun, you know? It's just, like, kind of those cult movies that they're fun to watch and they play with that fantasy lore of vampires werewolves, and all that stuff. And I feel yeah. like this could live within that world. Uh, as far as, as the trailer itself, I think, you know, they're doing a good job following the Morbius storyline from the comic books and the cartoons where basically, you know, Michael has a disease, a blood disease, and he's trying to fix it. And in that he turns into a vampire. Right. So they're, you know, they're going along with that. I think he looks cool too. At the end, you see a brief glimpse of what he looks like f fully uh, mutated and he looks just like the comic books and just like the 90s uh, animated series for Spider-Man. That's yeah. actually the Morbius I like the most. That's where I would see him the most because I was obsessed with that that series. But the end of the trailer, we freaking get Michael Keaton, Vulture from Spider-Man right. Homecoming, talking to Morbius for like three seconds, confirming that somehow, some way. The, the MCU, or at least the Spider-Man characters from the MCU, are within the Sony live-action universe. Yeah, and I just there's just so many possibilities. Like, is is it now full on? Like after the snap from Iron Man, does that mean something happened in the timelines and it brought these characters in? Uh, does that mean the Vulture? with the tech he had from the Tinkerer, made some kind of portal to cross over to this alternate reality where the Spider-Man villains exist. Like, there's so many possibilities. But even beyond that, it's like, is Kevin Foggy involved with the Sony movies now? That means Venom 2 just got done shooting, and that comes out after Morbius. So we're definitely going to get an Easter egg for that as well because they're clearly going for Sinister Six. Right. We're going to have Morbius, uh, Mysterio, because he's probably not dead, uh, then Venom... A uh, shocker, vulture, and I'm probably missing one. Did I say electro? I didn't say electro. I'm not electro. One of no. So let's see. We got venom. We got Morbius, yeah, Morbius. We got vulture. Scorpion. Scorpion. Shocker and Mysterio. There we go. Mysterio's probably not dead. You know, because Master probably. of Illusion. So they're setting this up. So the Sinister Six is gonna prob is gonna be half built in the Sony verse. It seems or right. the MCU now. I'm, I just. I want answers, Tim. <laughs> I want <laughs> answers. How is this going to come together? What does that mean? Again, is Feige involved with, with that? He has to because now that they're intertwined or they're one thing, he has to be involved in some way. Yeah. So I want answers. But I'm very – I'm kind of happy about it, but not at the same time because I think it could, it could be done – it could be done and still work, especially since the, the Sony movies are new. There are three in because we got Venom. Mm -hmm. Venom 2 is already shot, and Morbius is obviously already shot and coming out soon. So – we're three movies in, but two of those movies are going to already be intertwined with the MCU. The only one that's not going to have a reference was the Venom movie. So, you know, maybe, you know, this early in, they could make it work. Although I do see the concern for, you know, bringing the Sony movies, which haven't recent, you know, haven't been received as well, nearly as well as the MCU movies, minus Spider-Verse, but that's mm -hmm. animated. Uh, so I do see the, the cause for concern. But if Feige is going to have a good involvement in this, Maybe we can make it work. Curious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say, like, for me, from my vantage point, I mean, one of the biggest takeaways of that for me, you know, is that it clearly confirmed that Sony really had Disney over a barrel mm -hmm. uh, with the Spider-Man hostage situation. <laughs> um, and Disney had to concede 
uh, probably more than they wanted to, uh, to get Spider-Man back in the fold for the MCU. And th- that, because I would be extremely surprised, extremely surprised if that was in the works and planned prior to the in- the whole Spider-Man ordeal. Right. Um, I, I, my bet would be that that happened after the fact, and that was part of the arrangement is, okay, you can have Spider-Man back if you contribute more money and... You know, because mm-hmm. it was it was widely known that they wanted Kevin Feige directly involved in their Spider-Man, you know, centric films. I understand why Kevin Feige didn't want to do that. That's a really he's already got an insane workload, mm-hmm. you know, building out the MCU to also have to not only be involved in these extra films, but now he's also dealing with another studio and, uh, you know, and, and all of the politics that go into that. It's a lot. It's a lot, and he did not want to do it. That was one of the reasons why they had problems the first time around with Spider-Man is because right. it wasn't just about money. Is They wanted Kevin Feige, and he was like, no, I don't want to do that. So I think that the problem now and the what would be the concern, because like you, I thought the Morbius trailer was just okay. I, mm-hmm. I had It has some concerns for me, just, but I think it speaks more to the next part that I, for me – as a producer myself, I can see would be his concern probably for Kevin Feige's is quality control. Yeah. Because now if you're going to integrate and now you're going to say these two worlds cross over, you know, Sony owns all that. So there's a, he's got either got to be directly involved, but even if he is, there's going to be a battle over, you know, the content, you know, what they do and they don't do and stuff like, cause it's, again, it's two totally different studios, but, it, but it's curious because, he worked, you know, the Spider-Man films. Mm-hmm. Those are all in conjunction. He has to work with Sony for them. Right. It's, it's a Sony MCU film. So what if, in the, you know, the first two Spider-Men, I, widely received, people like them. I dig them, especially, mm-hmm. actually both of them. I like them both a, a lot. Uh, I think it's the best live-action Spider-Man films we've got to date, even though I have a soft spot for the Raimi right. ones. I grew up with that. But, right. you know, uh, I love Tom Holland as Spider-Man. And if they go that route, like, that's another thing. Is the Morbius trailer going to be start just like the MCU, uh, the MCU Spider-Man movies, where it's like a Sony film? in conjunction with Marvel Studios? At this point, you would think it might because it, this clearly is part of the arrangement to keep Spider-Man in the MCU. Now, the weird thing about that is that the fact that it's only the deal that they made with Sony was only for one movie to keep Spider-Man as right. of right now. As of right now. It's correct. for one yeah. film only. Mm-hmm. So it seemed it's, it's the whole thing is weird because, yes, while Sony was involved uh, in the sense of like, you know, now they're really parading that out from the studio that brought you home, <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming and Far From Home. The reality is, is that, you know, that was those were not Sony films. Those were Marvel Studios, mm-hmm. Kevin Feige, MCU right. films. Yes, Sony owns the rights to Spider-Man in films. So technically it was a Sony film in mm-hmm. conjunction with Marvel Studios. But everybody knows those were Kevin Feige Marvel MCU for sure they were so overseen movies and so Sony was of course involved but it was more in terms of you know you know a technical standpoint not a not actual hands on I am curious though because I know you mentioned that uh, Feige didn't want now do we have like a confirmation that he didn't want to do that or is this where where, that were those were the reports at the time. Because I was know that Sony wanted Kevin Feige as part of the deal. Okay, because I know f- there was an interview with Kevin F- when Venom, I believe, was uh, coming out. They were doing press for that, and I think at the same time another MCU movie was coming out. Um, so Feige somehow ended up in an interview with one of the heads at Sony, mm-hmm. and the interviewer asked uh, her, uh, the representative from Sony, "Is this in the MCU?" And she was nodding her head, "Yes." And literally in the same clip, Feige's like, "No." But kind of like awkward, right. like, no, it's not. Yeah. It is not. Well, she was. She kind of alluded to like you never know what could happen, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. a deal. And she was just like, we would like to see that. And Kevin Feige looked terrified, <laughs> utterly terrified, because the look on his face was like, that's not what we discussed. Yeah. So and she. So it was. It was very clear that this. That's what Sony wanted, and was hoping to eventually get to. And Marvel and Kevin Feige was like, no. Well, my point. My point. My point with that is kind of like. You know, what is going on behind the scenes? Because another thing, you know, 
the whole thing happened where the MC, where Spider Man was out of the MCU for a bit because right. the contracts up, the Disney Sony couldn't agree. But then you hear the story that we got on like uh, Jimmy Kimmel and stuff like that, where Tom Holland called uh, Bob Iger drunk, nonetheless, yeah. like crying apparently, and be like, "Hey man, I wanna, I still wanna be in the MCU." <laughs> so Iger was like, "All right, I got this," and called you know the president yeah. of Sony, and they worked out a deal. But what is? I know we know the deal is for now is you know to finish off the trilogy, and apparently connect the MCU or at least right. the Spider-Man characters to the Sonys in some way. But like how long, cause now that we know this and they clearly, this is going to be, they're building to the sinister mm-hmm. six, even though they only agreed for one film to finish off the trilogy, there's no way that it's going to yeah. be. One. Or does that mean after this one film, it's that a they, handoff. they're using it as a transition to bring Tom Holland purely to the Sony films. That would be my thought is that because it's, and it's the one film thing. Because I think it's two things. One, Kevin Feige does not want to do to be a, to have to be associated and directly involved with Sony's films on top of all the things they're developing in the MCU. Mm-hmm. He clearly does not want to do that. Every indication that we've seen is that he doesn't want to do that. So uh, the deal, th- there's a very good chance that the deal was okay, we're going to do one more film. That way we can wrap some things out on the And then there, there's a handoff, and Sony takes the Tom Holland Spider-Verse. Do you know how sad I would be? Like, yeah, be we, we just got Spider-Man. But I mean, it's been several, you know, two Avengers movies, Civil mm-hmm. War, two Spider-Man movies. Like, he's been in, like, I guess five movies yeah. already. But it was so long that we wanted him back. And, like, mm-hmm. he needs, remember, like, Spider-Man Homecoming. That a lot of people were saying it was called Spider-Man Homecoming because he was coming home. Right. Like Spider-Man, I believe, is still the best-selling comic book character for Marvel for sure. overall. It's Spider-Man. Everyone knows. Like the three most recognizable superheroes in the world are Superman, Batman, and Spider-Man. Yeah. So the fact that we just got him back and he's been back for a few years, and for him to go back to Sony would it would break my heart. Plus, they yeah. have set him up. Like obviously, if they were to do that and use the third movie to rewrite some stuff and make him transition back. But they already have stuff currently. They're basically making him, like, in a sense, not the next Iron Man, but they're kind of they're making him the next Iron Man in the sense where he's going to be one of the next pillars. Because in the right. first 10 years, it was Captain America and uh, Iron Man, and they're clearly making Spider-Man one of those pillars. Like, yeah. It's Spider-Man. He's, like, their most popular character. Yeah. So they have big plans for him, and, you know, we were going to see him in more Avengers films, and you know they weren't going to stop at three movies. I mean, Thor's on his fourth movie. Sure. So Spider-Man, you would go on forever with Spider-Man. At least they would want to. They would want to, you would think, as long as Tom Holland and everyone, you know, and the stories are there, they'd be willing to. Point is, they were not done with him. We had several more years yeah. of good stuff. And Tom Holland's him. so young. Right. So, oh, man. It's yeah. making, I don't even want to think about it. It's making me annoyed. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, the thing is, when it comes to stuff like this, it's there's so much politics yeah. involved, and you know this is big, big, big dollar stuff. This is big money involved, a lot of politics. You know when you were when you were talking about how Tom Holland called Bob Iger, and you know now after the fact that you know they were going in interviews, and in most cases, in my experience, that's what you know that's PR spin. That you're putting a, a happy face on an unpleasant situation. That right. you know there was some arguing back and forth and some. Uh, you know, it wasn't a, a super fun situation they worked out, and so they're putting a fun, happy face to clean up after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure stuff like that did happen, but in all likelihood, what really happened was, you know, Bob Iger sat down with his direct reports. They looked at the numbers. They looked at how this this deal, you know, losing Spider Man was going to affect the bottom line, the MCU, their dollar amounts, you know, in, in releases going forward. Right. Uh, not just in feature film, but also on their Disney Plus plans and blah 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 blah. Um, and he didn't like the numbers that he got back, and they said, okay, we got to make this happen. Right. You know, that's more than likely what actually happened. It's just so annoying that, like, you know, it's a business, first and foremost, obviously. Yeah, all, everything, right. you know, you know, the Marvel Comics, all of these things are businesses. The right. only reason they exist is because we give them money for their product. Yeah. But it's annoying that us fans have to always suffer because of the, you know— all the corporate greed and politics that go behind the scenes. Yeah. Not always. We get a lot. We are spoiled. I don't want to make it sure. Seem, we yeah, get a that's lot, what I was about to good, say. A lot, like, a lot yeah. of good stuff. But you know, in situations like this where it's like mommy and daddy are bickering, we're like the kid in the middle, like, but, but can you just make it work out though? <laughs> like, you know yeah, what I mean? I mean, I guess I don't look at it that way <laughs> because you know, at the end of the day, I don't care what it is. There's business involved, and there is realities to that business. You know, mm-hmm. it's like do they make a lot of money for sure, mm-hmm. and these these are big, big. But these things also cost a lot of money. For sure. And it takes a lot of people's time and effort. And it's like, you know, if you have two companies that aren't seeing eye to eye, 
Yeah. And they're seeing the approach very vastly different, you know, then you know, those two should not be working together. Now, if they can find a compromise and a middle ground, which it seems like Disney and Sony did on mm-hmm. some level, we, you know, we're not going to know what the extent of that is probably till after this next Spider-Man movie. And we find out whether they're going to renew again or it's just going to be yeah. there is going to be that handoff we just talked about. Um, but, you know, it's it's best even for the content, I would say, if there's going to be a bunch of, you know, conflict, you know, that's just going to directly impact the actual content itself anyway. And we're going to wind up getting bad films or messed up stories because everybody's, you know, going to want to try and interfere and have their fingerprint. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's like that conflict there is what, you know, I feel like us fans get caught in the middle a lot of where mm-hmm. it's like, because no, I want to, you know, everyone wants their fingerprint and their stamp on thing. I want yeah. this version, that version. And, you know, especially with characters this iconic, yeah. everyone wants to be the guy that's like, I made that, I, you know, that's my mark. That's yeah. why that Spider-Man or that character is awesome. And then yeah. it's like a lot of the times, you know, it's just like, well, now we get nothing for a few years. Again, I don't want to sound sound like we get awesome stuff. The yeah. MCU, we, we are in the golden age of comic books yeah. with movies, video games. But, you know, if, you, if we're going to be critical, which we are, we're talking about these characters sure. and stuff like that. That's what we do. Uh, it does feel like that sometimes. So, and it's, you know. Again, that's not to say that we don't get amazing stuff all the times, but when you're really getting critical about it, it's like, oh, man, just work it out for us. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think really what boils down to, like for me, it's just it always lands back at the regrettable moments of Marvel because they didn't realize what they had in terms of cinematic From properties. the beginning, right? Right. So, and they, they license these things to so many different studios. Yeah. And so now it's this, you know, complicated situation. Like even with Disney, even even the theme park rights, even what they're when they're trying while they're yeah. trying to expand Marvel into their theme parks, they can only do it in certain areas. They can't do it in Orlando because of Universal. They license theme park rights to Universal there. So Crazy. they can only do it in California and overseas. It's like, you know, and Marvel really had their stuff spread out in a way that DC didn't really do. Mm-mm. Um, so it's just more complicated. Yeah. And that, that's kind of the thing that I always come back to. is like, man, that was such a bummer. Had they not re- realized that early on and said, you know, we need to make sure we protect this or keep it all in one place. Kind of spinning out of that a little bit, not to get too much all off topic, but we've talked about it here on the show. Like, I really do think, like, like much like in comic books, I even think right now for 2020, I think we're going to see the rise of Marvel sales and, you know, good stories come up where, you know, me and a bunch of fans in general are going to be like, yeah, Marvel's doing some work right in now. In comics, you mean? Yeah, in, com- in comic yeah, books. Okay. And, you know, I think DC might dip a little bit. I think, because every every publisher and every business, they have their years, like they're building years, right. so to speak. I think DC is going to kind of be in a rebuilding year right now where they're kind of trying to reset and do things where Marvel's like in full swing. You know, they got uh, Donny Cates, mm-hmm. you know, Hickman uh, with the X-Men and all these things, Mortal Hulk with Al Ewing and all this stuff like firing at tens. Everyone's right. loving it where, you know, DC currently is just kind of kind of sitting there in a, Strangely. Re- in a rebuilding year. But to that point, um, I think that's going to happen with the movies where the MCU reigns supreme overall for movies for a long while. Again, mm-hmm. we've talked about this before. But slowly but surely, it seems like DC is getting their act together mm-hmm. and kind of rising. You know, it kind of started with Wonder Woman. Then Aquaman was a billion dollars. And Shazam did really, really well. Joker has got... Uh, 11 Oscar nominations, which we're going to talk about later in the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got the Batman with Matt Reeves and Pat- yep. Pattinson, which is going to be a trilogy. It looks it's looking to be amazing and so on and so forth. But it's like, you know, it, there's always a changing of the tides. It seems like they both can't be doing, you know, uh, be on fire at the same time for whatever reason, mm-hmm. both in publishing and the movies. But I'm glad each has their time to shine because, you know, DC Rebirth was amazing. And at that time, Marvel was kind of... Yeah, you know, n- doing not so hot. So it's funny that we're kind of getting the shifts. Yeah. It's it's weird how that works. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, you know, I've 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 long talked about that's the cyclical nature of these things, yeah. and and that's been my prediction and viewpoint for probably two years now, is that we're probably after the Infinity Saga, mm-hmm. we're likely to see Marvel start to tick down a little bit because it's very dip- difficult to replicate something like that. Yeah, like just the immense. <laughs> you know, feet that was, it's never been, it's never been done. In like cinema history, yeah. it was so amazing. So the chance, yeah. the chances of them replicating that, it's just, it, the fa- it's not on their side, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, the likelihood is, is that it's still going to be popular. They're still going to make a crap ton of money. It's just pr- not going to be the same as that first 10 years. Right. You know, replicating that's going to be really tough. Um, 
it, whereas, as you said, on the flip side, DC, who had struggled out of the gate, mm-hmm. is starting to figure it out. And we're likely to see them start to figure it out even further. Yeah. And we're likely to get some really solid DC films uh, in the next five to ten years. You know, like, and if Joker is any indication, oh, you know, mm-hmm. some of the things that we might get in terms of just like one-offs and, you know, unique films mm-hmm. that are just standalones. Um, so, yeah, and the publishing is the exact same. It, I do think it's interesting, though, that DC um, is in, I don't, I don't know if you want to call it a state of flux, but it certainly feels it does. like they're in a little bit of a, they're in a trend, especially with this 5G, 5G stuff that we've talked about already, is, you know, the transitional period, it, it feels like odd that it, and quickly kind of came up. Yeah, the creative teams are definitely changing a lot on a lot of their big books. Snyder's yeah. just leaving Justice League, mm-hmm. and uh, Robert Vendetti's taking over. Tom King left Batman, and now yeah. we got James Tynan doing that. Tom Taylor's doing Suicide Squad now. Right. Uh, so, yeah, there's de- they're definitely in a big changing or shifting gears kind of process. Yeah. I don't know if you want to call it upheaval. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does, in some ways, it does feel like a total I will revamp. say, San Diego Comic-Con this year is probably going to have some massive yeah. announcements for DC. Agreed. I think, so we'll probably learn a little more Agreed. about that. Because w- we say it all the time, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire, where you see all these rumors <laughs> yeah. and stuff coming out, is like, yeah. something's going to happen. <laughs> but I do very much feel like Marvel, like you said, is 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 starting to really get, it, you know, get into it a new gear mm-hmm. when it comes to comics yeah. and DC is kind of shifting down, trying to figure some stuff, some stuff out, which again, kind of felt like it came out of nowhere for me, which selfishly as uh, a reader who, you know, can't spend like $500 a month on comic books. It's like, Oh, well if you know, that's not doing so hot, I guess I'll throw more of my money on all this stuff. That's good over here. You right, know what I right. mean? So I guess it kind of works out in an odd way. <laughs> <laughs> half, half empty or half full. How you want to look at it? <laughs> But uh, going back to the Morbius trailer, yeah. which is where we began, um, I, I think that we both agree that the Morbius trailer, it looks, in and of itself, it looks, eh, okay. Yeah. Looks okay. It has some things that was like, okay, that could be cool. It's like the Joker's a vampire now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but then the 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 crossover part is was definitely the standout. It was the most. It was the biggest reveal by far, and it was the standout moment. We of the watched it together, and literally, you saw. I was just my hands on my head. And I went, "No, yeah." Like it was as a soon verbal, as I heard his like, voice, I was like, "What?" Because so, they can we just talk? I mean, I know we've been ranting about this for a while. We, we, we're going to move on, but just how they hid that from everyone. I know, like no one. And also, was that an was? I know. We got that little Easter egg, but is that even going to be a big part of the movie, or is that just going to be like you know he's in it for like two minutes, just as almost as like that one scene we see in the trailer is just going to play out a little more? Can you imagine if that's literally the after credits, oh like post credit scene, <laughs> and they just gave it away up? I mean, but that's gonna it would be smart though. Mm-hmm. I kind of see. I didn't really think about this, but it's very smart on Sony's part because that's going to let all the fans know that this is an MCU thing. It's connected to the MCU, so mm-hmm. you need to see this movie. And the one thing we didn't mention is that you also see Spider-Man spray-painted yes. on a wall in the trailer. Correct. And it says Murderer, which is a direct tie-in to Far From Home mm-hmm, with Mysterio. Yep. And the big reveal at the end of Far From Home where he, you know, Peter Parker gets outed. Although, oddly enough, I, I, I'm a nerd, obviously. <laughs> no. And I screenshotted it, and I pull, zoomed it in. Mm-hmm. It is the Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Right. Though. You see the, the spider symbol, mm-hmm. the exact same, and even the silver webbing, because that yeah. was a big thing with, you know, he had that gloss to the webbing. Yeah. So I'm wondering if they did that just because, you know, you didn't get worked out. So like, well, we have the rights to Sam, Sam Raimi Spider-Man, and we could just spin it and say it was graffiti art, so it's not identical. Yeah. You know what I mean? I wonder if that was like... I don't, I don't know. know it's man. curious to see why they use that version of Spider-Man yeah. in the, the art. Yeah, I mean, there's so many possibilities, and we even talked about, like, you know, is it possible that it, they're going to do some sort of, like, Spider-Verse type deal where this is, like, you know, my uh, Vulture, you know, because he has access to all this alien tech that he figured, and they're able to transverse through wormholes. Is Tinker the, working yeah, with him. Yeah, uh-huh. is this have something to do where he figured out how to get into an alternate universe of somehow, some kind? Um, you know, who knows? There's a lot of different ways they could go with it, but mm. definitely, 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 like you said, it was really smart of Sony because that put a whole bunch of new weight onto the film. For sure, yep. That probably wouldn't have been there as strongly 
mm-hmm. as I mean, a lot of people are anticipating Morbius. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are looking forward to it and stuff like that. But this adds extra weight for sure. And also, but you know, before we move on, I did want to mention one other thing. Uh, Miles Morales is already established. We know that mm-hmm. from Homecoming. Yep. He is in that world. So yep. we technically, you know, know we're going to at least get another version of Spider-Man at some point. Right. Because they full on mentioned him in Homecoming. Right. So, or referenced him. So we already got two Spider-Men. I mean, let's get 2099. Let's get some Scarlet, Ben Riley. You know what I mean? Go wild, man. <laughs> and if they do, tr- if they do, if this is, does prove to be some kind of a, a, a beginnings of a handoff mm-hmm. to Sony and just saying, okay, well, here you go. We gave you the Vulture and so Tinkerer curious. and, the, you know, all these different characters, and we set it all up for you, and now you take it and run, and maybe Kevin Feige operates as some sort of a consulting, on a consulting yeah. basis of some kind to make sure it doesn't go crazy. Um, you know, it, it it could be pretty cool in the end, you mm-hmm. know? It's just it, it will not be, you know, it won't be the MCU. No. Well, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> but staying in uh, the Marvel trailers, because we got lots of cool Marvel trailers, we also finally got a second trailer for New Mutants, which mm-hmm. has been on the shelf since, mm-hmm. like, 20... This movie's been shot since 2017. Yeah. And it has just been because, you know, it was going to release when Disney acquired Fox. Right. So it got just put in, beforehand. Just before. So it got put in limbo. They did a bunch of reshoots. Yep. Um so that's another one where there was no hint to that being connected to the MC the MCU. But obviously, you know, the internet. There's like, well yeah. maybe, you know, they're doing that Deadpool three is apparently already working. Ryan Reynolds is already working with, you know, Disney and stuff to kind of see how they're gonna incorporate that. But uh what did you think of the new mutant trailer? I thought it was uh, I like the horror elements. I think that's a fantastic idea, which is why I'm uh, excited for uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, even yeah. though they just lost Scott Derrickson, the director. I was going to bring that up, too, so yeah. That's, that's unfortunate. I'm sure it's because he wanted to go s- uh, maybe more horror, and then they're Clearly. like, no, PG-13-ish. <laughs> uh, yeah, they cited creative differences, which usually... Correct, yeah. yeah so, uh, But I think, you know, I will say I'm not... I didn't read the most mutant uh, books growing up. I did read a few here and there, and a lot of the characters I think they're using... For uh, this movie is really cool. We got Sunspot, Wolfsbane, uh, Magic, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. She's got like the Soul Sword, so that's uh, that's gonna be fun. Uh, Daniel Moonstar, which was the coolest part in the trailer for me, because that is the run I did read. It was like a four issue mini series, I believe, uh, and we see uh, Demon Bear in there. You see him real quick, and in the comics, that's like originally it was like something in her imagination, uh, you know, yeah. kind of. And so there's a lot of rumors thinking is this whole movie actually like an hallucination right and we're gonna find that out because they're in like this you know psych ward type deal so i'm excited for it i i j- the fact that it's a horror superhero movie it, it sounds like i said horror <laughs> horror <laughs> superhero movie uh j- just has me excited even though again i'm familiar with these characters and i have read them you, you know but i'm not i'm not deep in it like i am with yeah. like spider-man or the avengers or something but i i am looking forward to this movie yeah i kind of fall into the camp of um I, i'm I'm going to see it for sure, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, but I don't have much anticipation for this movie for the reason of because it kept getting shelved. Right. Yeah. Um, that's usually not a good sign for a movie. Um, if, they, if, if a studio is excited about a film. Now, the reason I'm giving this kind of more of a benefit of a doubt is because it was acquired. Yes. Right. So this was a movie that was being done while it was in the middle of an acquisition between two studios. Um, but the you know I'll give it the benefit of the doubt, mm-hmm. but it still for me it still makes it go, uh, the, especially with the amount of reshoots, um, how many times it got pushed, mm-hmm. um, things like that. So there's, in my opinion, there's likely, you know, it. I I started getting Justice League vibes. Okay. Not it, not as Frankenstein-ish in terms say, of like yeah. directors changing and all of that kind of thing. But you know the you know when you see this kind of stuff happen in the movie, it's usually because there's there's story issues and um, so I'm I'm gonna see it and I thought this trailer did look better mm-hmm. you know um, but you know I'm already not a huge horror fan okay yeah, that's true yeah you, said you that know that now. so but I do really like that this is a different take mm-hmm. so when they first announced that they were doing this movie. I was like, oh, that could be really cool, like a psychological thriller, yeah, yeah. you know, wrapped around mutants. Uh, that could be really dope. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, you saw the first trailer. It's like, okay, you know. And then this one looks a little bit better. So I'm, I'm going to – I'm definitely going to see it, but I'm, I don't have a ton of anticipation for it. Yeah, and I know everyone was saying, like, the Phoenix, uh, you know, X-Men Phoenix uh, was, like, the last X-Men movie. Mm-hmm. This is technically the last Fox X-Men because although yeah. they did reshoots and – 
it, it may be somewhat of a Frankenstein, you know, the majority of this film is still going to be what Fox intended, I would imagine. I would have to imagine, yeah. at least on some level. Like, like the base of it, right? Yeah. So, but I'm curious to see, is this because now that it is under the Disney banner, even though, you know, it's not in the MCU that we're aware of, mm -hmm. uh, it, how they're going to make it a one and done. If that's the fact, I'm, you know what I mean? I feel like this is going to be kind of a joker. Okay. Where yeah. they're going to push this out there. This was just like a side story. It's right. not going to be directly connected to anything. And then see how the audience responds to it. Unless they blow our blow our minds like the Morbius trailer, and right? I, I, yeah, I'm hoping. I'm, that's my hope is that my lack of anticipation actually works to my favor. Mm -hmm. And it comes out and it's actually pretty good. And then I'm like, oh, wow, that was that was much better than I thought. Yeah. Um, you know. Because the difference would be, though, too, like Disney is Fox now. They own Fox. So there mm -hmm. wouldn't be no two studios going there. Like they would have full, yep. do have full control over this now. They, they yeah. bought them. <laughs> They're like, yeah. your hours now. <laughs> <laughs> but one more trailer before we get into some other news. We got the birds, the second Birds of Prey trailer. Yes. Birds we did. Of, now, <laughs> that alone says a lot. Um, everyone knows I've been very vocal on Variant over the years that Harley Quinn is my favorite female comic book character. For sure. I love me some Harley Quinn because, again, say it all the time, I'm a broken freaking record. Batman the Animated Series got me the comic books. I love it dearly. And she was created in that. Mm -hmm. And that because of that, you know, I was just like, oh, yeah, her and the Joker just had a good dynamic. You know, well, you know, it was a crazy psychotic dynamic. But yeah. it was a fun dynamic, especially for the show and the way that, you know, they fought. And you didn't like her, but she loved him. Uh, I just like her as a character. She's goofy. She's fun. She's lethal. And I'm just a Harley Quinn fan. So I really, really wanted this movie to be good because I liked Margot Robbie mm -hmm. as uh, Harley Quinn. I know Suicide Squad is considered by many to be the worst DCE movie to date. Um, I said it before, though. I, Although I agree that it's not, you know, fantastic by any means, I still had fun with it because... I, I'm a sucker for that stuff with, you know, when Batman was chasing them in Gotham City. Right, sure. It's like, we never got to see that before. So just even though, you know, the movie as a whole wasn't, like, great, I'm like, that was still really cool to see, like, you know, Batman chasing Joker and Harley Quinn in the Batmobile. Right. And then uh, then other little beats here and there. And I thought the soundtrack, too, was really, really good. I still yeah. listen to that soundtrack. Anyway, was fun. I was hoping they were going to change it a little bit, but it very much seems like they're just following the Suicide Squad tone vibe and everything 100 i thought they were gonna soft boot it a little bit yeah because you know but they're still even referencing leto uh, leto's joker and you know in the trailer we see that she's saying she broke up with him so now this is her like teaming up with a posse right to, to fight black mask and stuff and overall i'm just i'm like kind of a little disappointed and it's and it's making me sad because i love harley quinn and i you know i'm a fan of huntress and black canary too and it's yeah. just like <sighs> is this not gonna be good is this gonna let me down <laughs> you know well i think if i'm gonna make a prediction on that i'm gonna say yes yeah uh okay so to be fair to be fair because i don't like the bash movies right uh to be fair uh they clearly kind of had a course with harley quinn when they set out on suicide squad mm -hmm. so there was a tone already established right it's very hard to undo that and you know with the same actress right if they had recast harley quinn you know, okay, you can get, but they kept the same Harley Quinn, so they had to maintain some level of that tone. Right. Um, what surprised me and has surprised me about this film is they took the tone of Suicide Squad, and I feel like they ramped it to a 10. Yeah. And it's like really lots of glitter. Yeah, it's the color palette. Yeah. yeah, so I feel like this movie is probably going to, you know, uh, there's going to be some that are going to like, oh, that's so fun and really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be a lot of people like, what on earth is this? So I think it's good. This is very much going to fall into the category of movie of like, you either love this movie or you hate this movie's guts. Yeah. There's not going to be much in between. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so sad because again, like they even in the latest trailer, they even referenced Bruce Wayne. She references Bruce yeah. Wayne in the trailer. You know, she's got uh, her hyena in yeah. there too. So they're bringing all these elements where I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And it's very much they're using, you know, the Jimmy Palmiotti, Amanda Connor, yeah. Harley Quinn from the comics, yeah. uh, and kind of taking, pulling a lot of aspects from there where she's, you know, like, well, what do they call it? Like roller jamming or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. just on the roller skates with the helmet and beating people up with like her mallet. Roller derby. Roller derby, yeah. So, you know. <sighs> It is, it's probably going to let me down, but, like, the, the I'm trying to hold hope even though I know that, again, I don't want to bash it. <laughs> yeah. I just want it to be good. <laughs> and the other interesting thing for me is how many characters they're introducing also. 
There's a, quite a few. With this film, you know, just Black Mask alone, mm -hmm. you know, but then you've also got Black Canary in mm -hmm. there. You've got these characters in the, and you're just like, it, it, I don't know, for, for them to be introducing this many characters into this movie, it really makes, kind of sets you back to like, where's DC going? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there is, there's definitely a big ensemble. You got uh, Renee Montoya, Huntress, Black Canary, Cassandra Kane, which, as we know, you know, Batgirl and or Orphan. So that's a she, she her alone is a massive character. Mm -hmm. Like especially in recent DC Rebirth continuity, right. they made Orphan and Cassandra like Kane a massive staple of the Bat family. So I don't know, and it always brings up the question too: Where is Matt Reeves' Batman movie going? Are we because we yeah. we do know. Uh, that uh, the Flash director, I uh, forget his name, uh, Andy, Andy Machetti. Is it Mas Machetti? Machetti. 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 Okay. I remember it because spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Machetti uh, did confirm that his Flash movie, whenever it comes out, 2022 or what have you, uh, is going to be still loosely based on the Flashpoint movie. Right. So the DCEU, with that, that's their scapegoat. They could reset, do whatever they want because sure. Flash could F up the timelines, and now Pattinson is looks Batman looks like Pattinson because of this. Right. He's younger now because of this. And but that's after the Batman comes out. It is that is true. That's post that the Batman. That is true. So I I don't know, man. I don't know what, what's going on. Yeah, it's it's just really <laughs> interesting because they're still carrying on with all of the characters that in were initiated in the Snyder verse. Wonder, Wonder Woman's got a movie this yeah. year. Wonder Aquaman's getting a sequel. Shazam. Shazam's getting a sequel, which Shazam wasn't part of Snyder's films. So, I mean, Superman was in it, was in it at the end. It tied in. Yes, but we never actually saw him, so they could still kind of work around that. Oh, you mean as far as his face goes? Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, you just saw saying. his body. Right, right, right. Uh, so th they could definitely work around that, but everything else is still contained within the Snyderverse, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously minus the Joker and now the upcoming The Batman film. Right. So it's, it's, it's still making me go, like, I'm not sure which direction. So uh, while they're making better movies... You know, as far as how they all tie together and what the continuity is going to be, what the Curious. tones are going to be, is this going to be Harley Quinn's last film or is Margot Robbie going to maintain the role and they're going to continue this? There's just still so many questions when it comes to DC. It's crazy. And so, like I said, now they're introducing all these new characters in the Harley Quinn film. And it's like, I can't imagine they're all going to be one and done. Yeah. I mean, it's also a rated R film, which I think, mm -hmm. you know, is a. Uh, uh, a unique choice too, considering Suicide Squad was PG thirteen and it's literally the same character. And just make a studio making a rated R movie alone is just gonna you know kill a good chunk of box office oh, yeah. right there. Because yeah. I don't think this movie is gonna do gangbusters like the Deadpool movies where those like made a billion dollars. Yeah, I don't think this is gonna do that. I, I could be wrong. I'm just assuming though. Uh, uh, but again, to your point, I'm curious to see where they're gonna go. And you know, in the Shazam movie, they did reference Batman and Superman, although they kept it. Big enough where yep. anyone could be that Batman or Superman. Uh, there's lots of rumbles in the pipeline of, you know, we're getting Flash still. Uh, people are still talking about a Nightwing movie. So so I, fascinating. Yeah, I, I don't know where it's going to go. It's just, oh, there's just so much happening, which is hilarious because yeah. over the weekend we were talking about how, yeah, there has, wasn't much going on. It's been pretty quiet. Right, right. And then it was like come Monday morning it was like an explosion. Oh, we're also getting, there. Were, Tom King is actually uh, co-writing the New Gods movie. Actually, yes. Weekend. So yes. that's uh -huh. we're getting a new gods movie, which that you would think it would be, you know, weird if not is gonna introduce Dark Side because yeah, Dark, new god. You know what I mean? Yeah. So very, very curious. And it's like, are they gonna be setting some new timeline with that? I don't know. I so many questions so, when it comes to DC. Yeah, so yeah. many questions. But you caught up on Watchmen. You finished it. I did. You did. I so. did. I, I said I would, and I I was I'm a man of my word. <laughs> so <laughs> I gave my spoiler free thoughts last uh, podcast, and yeah. you said you would caught up and man of your word, man of my word. So what did you? Well, since they kind of already know what I think. Now we about, can talk freely. I yeah, yeah. What did you think? So we can talk a little freely now. Um. Well, for starters, I I I, I understand your tone that you had mm -hmm. when we spoke about it last time. Um. The so, you know, I said, I think after the, I think it was the fourth or fifth episode, mm -hmm. I, I had told you that I was already kind of feeling a vibe. And even after we watched the first uh, episode of the of the, the series, my opinion, I kind of, you know, was a little bit like, I just hope that they aren't using Watchmen and certain things to just really unload in a very heavy handed way on certain political topics. Right. So that was kind of a concern from the beginning, um, and what I will say about this, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna say this, 
I don't want to talk about it too much. For sure, yeah. Because yeah. For, for that reason, because mm-hmm. altogether, this was a very political series. Very, yeah. Uh, is a very, not just, you know, everything has opinions in it and messages of one way or another based on the writer and the creators of the film. That's normal. Mm-hmm. This was a very heavy-handed political series. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to get too much into it because that's not what we do here. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that um, it is well-made. For sure, perform- yeah. That continued, on, that, that continued um, whether you, you know, agree with their points or whatever, the writing was structurally it was it was good um there was it had definitely had some really cool interesting moments as you you had mentioned mm-hmm. uh, last time and in, in terms of how it relates to the comics mm-hmm. like it's incredible how you know how true they stayed to some original things but they did get away from that toward the end mm-hmm. which in certain ways was kind of like well, okay that was an interesting way to go i guess the most in the end you were kind of just for me i am i don't subscribe to the style of storytelling filmmaking where uh that is soapboxy like really heavy-handed soapboxy mm. messaging right where it like hits you over the head with a hammer i adhere to kind of the more where what? it's embedded within a cleverly crafted story and then you let the audience extract that themselves and come away with it where that's a question yes because i'm more drawn to that stuff too yes. where it's like this this is we're proposing you an idea or you know a situation what do you think right what would you do yeah i'm very much about uh i like to make the audience think yeah i like for me personally when i'm watching them i like stuff that makes me think and and a question is posed and i have to like work that out but it's right. done in such a way where there's a question and a possible answer and you have to try to piece that together i just think it's that is a better way of not treating your audience as if a they're dumb, mm-hmm. um, but also not condescending to them, because you in any way you know I guess the main the main thing is like when you do something like what they did with the Watchmen, what you end up doing is something akin to uh, or a better quality version of some of these cr- Christian or religious based films right. that you see. Right, you end up preaching to the choir. You're not reaching anyone, right? You're mm. you're not affecting anyone positively. If you are you're anyone who doesn't adhere to whatever your worldview is that's making that that creator, mm-hmm. that person is instantaneously turned off. They're not listening to you and they're probably gonna stop watching. Right. Right. Well, this show was very divisive. Like it was incredibly. It, it was very yeah. uh fifty fifty. And like I said the last podcast, uh the series as a whole, again, very well done. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, acting For is sure. great. You cannot say anything about the actual, you know, making a production of the show. Uh, but I w- did end 50-50 where, where I, you know, half of me really liked the series. Half of me was like, eh. But, like, I am, to be fair, I'm kind of like that with all the Watchmen stuff that was done after the fact of the original Alan Moore, Dave right. Gibbons novel. Yeah. Uh, because when DC did the before Watchmen, it very, you know, they did it around the New 52, and it very much felt like a money grab yeah. in a sense where they're just like, well, let's give all this backstory and detail to characters that really didn't need it. I mean, sure. It's, Oh, I love, you know, co- I'm a continuity junkie. Like yeah, for sure. I was telling you yesterday, actually that I love like uh, visual dictionaries and stuff mm-hmm. where everything has meaning and stuff. I, yeah. I just love diving into detail like that, which is why I guess like comics so much, but for certain characters and stuff, I feel like you don't need that, especially if a story is done to just a one and done. It's like, we were just talking about where like, here's, what if heroes are like this and they're not perfect? This is the question. This is what would happen at the end. One mm-hmm. and done. You know You know what I mean? Because that's kind of what Watchmen is. It's kind of asks a question like, you know, or it says that heroes are just like us. Yeah. You know, some of them are evil still. They have bad thoughts. They're messed up. They're not, they're not Superman. You right. know what I mean? They're not right. perfect. And I didn't think you necessarily, although cool, some of the before Watchmen stuff, I was like, okay, it's cool to know where like, you know, how Owlman started. Dr. Manhattan gets some side story stuff. I was like, but I don't I didn't really need it that much. And yeah. I kind of feel like that with this, where where it's like I didn't necessarily like where they went with certain things with Dr. Manhattan, where I was yeah. like, well, you know, spoilers for the end of the series where, you know, <laughs> yeah. he, uh, he kind of handed off the Dr. Manhattan. He passed the torch of the Dr. Manhattan yes. mantle uh, to his wife or mm-hmm. girlfriend. I don't know. Were they? It's his wife. It was his wife. Yeah, yeah his, his wife. wife. And, you know, now she, if they were to do a second season, would be the new Dr. Manhattan. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? At least they alluded to that. So there were certain things like that where, you know, it was like, it's fine, but I'm like, I don't know. 
It's like I kind of – it's Dr. Manhattan. You know what yeah. I mean? I want him to be Dr. Manhattan. Yeah. So there was a lot of little stuff like that as far as just the comic book person in me was like, but – even the we reasoning. The reasoning for it, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm saying in the sense of, like, how he did it. Or like why. The, like, how they killed Dr. Manhattan or captured him. Right. Right? How he, they're sitting there, they're trying to capture him, and he's literally going through and just smoking them. Now, he's not just, he's not just all-powerful. He's also omnipresent. Right? So he could have literally snapped his fingers, and everyone that was there controlling that device, while he was in the house, he could have snapped them into non-existence, but he did give them reason. They did. He did give reason for that. Remember, he kept saying it's because I don't want to change time. He's like, I know I'm not going to change. This is how it has to be. He was very much like, let it, let fate do what it needs to yeah. do. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, but it, that to my point, that's why I was like, but Doctor Manhattan was kind of, you know, especially in the comics, was he, sure he fought for America, and you know, mm -hmm. in the comics, yeah, that was the reason why they won. Uh, U.S. won the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. but it's. Like, he was very much, he left because he's like, screw earthlings. I don't want anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. He's selfish. You know, he a guy who could snap his fingers and literally cure cancer, bring someone back from the dead, was right. like, yeah, I'm going to Mars. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So they kind of made, I guess, I see where they kind of wanted to make him more human. Yeah. But I did like, you know, this, because in that transformation, you would no longer be human. You are this, you are this being of matter energy. Yeah. You are a god now. And I kind of like that he was detached from humanity. And I see what Lindelof is trying to do, kind of, I guess, bring him full circle. But, again, with this Watchmen sequels and prequels, I'm kind of like, I, just just the, the middle one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of, and I, and I agree with you um, in the sense of, like, you know, the original Watchmen was set to be one thing. You know, even in the original Watchmen uh, story, uh, you know, Dr. Manhattan, he has this very apathetic approach seemingly See, but really yeah. what it is is they say you know the the whole idea is that you know he is outside of time in a way right so he's seeing everything from a different perspective and even when he goes to mars why there's definitely that selfish element to it mm -hmm. there's also the element that he sees mankind differently he does so. he sees everything from this different perspective from this god uh you know perspective almost and so he sees like that man is basically self-destructive and all these things. There's nothing that you could do. You either have to eliminate them or create something brand new. For sure. Um, and that's kind of how he sees. So everything is just this very like matter of fact approach, even in, even in this series where he's, he's dealing with things and they're, I did think that that was cool. How they were, you know, people would get mad at him and he was just saying there, no, you don't understand. This has already happened. You know, and he's just saying things that have happened. These are just facts. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you what is. Yeah. I can't change that. You might not like it, but that's just what is. And I thought that was clever how they dealt with things that are that we can't change, but how human beings deal with them from an emotional place. Mm -hmm. And so we, we get angry or we deal with them emotionally, things that just are, and we can't change them whether we like them or not. Um, and so it's, a, they kind of dealt with how we address things, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And approach things in a, in, in that clever way through the eyes of Dr. Manhattan, which I thought was a, you know, as is always been one of the clever aspects of the character and those stories. For sure. How they deal with both sides where they do paint it, where mm -hmm. like, especially because the movie, Zack Snyder's movie that I think did that perfectly, like you said, where mm -hmm. I do like that he, you know, so what I was saying uh, before that, where he is this god who lives outside of time so because of that he, you know he's kind of like in in a roundabout way he's kind of like this is meaningless this is yeah. pointless. like this is like the smallest fraction of like you know <laughs> this big universe where right. this is insignificant almost and he doesn't understand that but i like you know i don't know it's it's weird i guess it just comes i guess for me like i was never even excited for the watchman series from the from the jump because again just the sheer like like do we need a do we need a sequel do we yeah. You know, like, I get it. Like, I was excited for the movie because that was just an adaptation of the comic. There was yeah. not, it was just, you know, telling the story. But for the, for Watchmen in particular, I don't know why, because I, I usually, I'm, I'm a fan of some sequels here and there, like when, you know, things are successful and stuff. But I, for some reason, Watchmen to me just feels like, I don't want to say a money grab, but it just feels like they're clearly using the property to push this or that. And since everyone likes this property they know they'll watch it yeah and that's how, kind of how i feel see i never got the the vibe that this was a money grab i genuinely feel 
that the creators of this series had some things they wanted to say, and they used the Watchmen characters and world See, that's what to makes, do that. That's what that, but that's the, kind of what I'm saying, though. That's kind of the, like I don't like when you use these already established characters or properties mm-hmm. to tell a story or theme or something that seems, you know, preachy or something. Yeah, so oh, I'm, well, I guess what I'm saying is that that as there is a difference between that and a money grab. I guess. Okay. Yeah, that's you fair. know what I'm saying. That's fair. That's so fair. yeah, I I I would agree with you there. That for sure was the case, and that was my concern after episode one, is mm-hmm. that that was going to be because again there are points made in the series that I agree with, mm-hmm. you know, and that you know again it goes back to the preaching of the choir thing, mm-hmm. right? You have people that are going to just turn this off. Yep. And then you have the other side, the people that adhere to whatever points that they're making, and they're just going to be like, yeah! <laughs> and it's like, is are you able to be effective in that? And that's just, again, approach to storytelling, approach to making a point that mm-hmm. you may have or whatever. Um, I will say, and I said this to you, I do feel like The Watchmen, like when I ended the series, I said to my wife, I feel like this series is could be a case study for why our politics are as jacked up and angry as they are. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, how everything is very, like, so in your face. Right, right, right. You know, and very, like, um, because, you know, whether you agree or you disagree, there's zero, uh, you know, arguing. This this series, you know, for the points that they were making, Mm -hmm. right or wrong, it definitely treated anybody who doesn't, adhere to whatever worldview or ideology they were espousing um, as, like, not just uh, wrong, but, like, the devil. It was it was demonizing and condescending and, and, you know, in a lot of ways. So it's like you, you wind up go- falling into the category of, like, is that a good approach? Do you like the film? Whether you like the series or not probably determines where you li- line up ideologically and worldview-wise and... You know, yeah. because as a watchman, from a watchman perspective, you know, you kind of have to just talk about you end up that's why I said I didn't really want to talk I don't really want to talk about it that much. And I know you kind of feel that way too, mm-hmm. because you can't really even talk about it that much from a comic book standpoint. You can't, no. I mean You can, can but, but it was all wrapped around this other thing. For sure, yeah. The way they the way they molded it and stuff like that. Yeah. And it, it just know. became like the skin You're right. for, you know, you know, a kind of a political comment and social commentary. I'm just curious to see if we're going to get a season two because it's very much like I know HBO wants to do it. Lindelof right. said they want to do it. He currently did say on a podcast, though, that he doesn't have a story at this point in time. I but would be. Sh- I, that, I said it to you. I don't know how they'll do a second season. But if, you know, if it did good in ratings, HBO would be like, oh, you want to write it? We'll get another writer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and I haven't <laughs> looked. Do you know if it's been if it, it's been had a uh, a pod? It, it's been positive for HBO if it did well. Uh, I, I know. I, I know. Looked. Rating wise, it did. It did pretty well. I know as far as reception from fans, it's very 50-50. It's yeah. been pretty split, and that's from the jump. Right. So, um, yeah. But Watchmen is again. To be fair, wa- I know people will be like, but. Watchmen is very political. It's all about you know the comedian like yes. you know I, I totally understand and, and you know it's about the Vietnam War and it's like yes for sure mm-hmm. but like I don't know it's just it's just one of those things that is <laughs> that is and that is totally fair right because that is one hundred percent true. Watchmen was always for sure a social commentary. Like Nixon and yeah stuff. we've talked yeah. about that uh, from the bit from the beginning. It has absolutely always been a social commentary and a political commentary on some degree. This just took that to like a level ten. I thought. I don't know. I for for, for me, I I just I'm more. I like to in storytelling to ask questions more yes. and deal on the more like happy side mm-hmm. of things because we know everything's but we know people are evil. We know people are bad. I don't think any you know if someone's arguing that you're an idiot because there is tons of evil in this world. We know that. Yeah. But I think you know just the state we've been in. Uh, things have been so volatile and stuff lately. I just like I want happy things. Like I want <laughs> stuff that's like, oh, there is good in the world. Yeah. There's lots of bad, but there's definitely more good because if there, you know, if there mm-hmm. wasn't uh, more good than bad, you couldn't go outside without getting shanked. Yeah. So I like stuff like that. And even in personal stuff that I'm doing, I always try to write, you know, to like, no, there's hope. That's why I love, you know, Superman stuff like that. There's, yeah. There was always hope, and as yeah. much bad and you know, as many like rapists and racists and evil people out there, mm-hmm. you're always the good is always going to outweigh the bad. And I think that's a message that needs to be pushed now more than ever. I couldn't agree more. I, I think that is actually one of the biggest things that we're missing right now in our dialogue. Just mm-hmm. e- not even just in our storytelling. I think it's story. Our storytelling is a reflection of how we're talking to and treating each other. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? 
um, and just our approach to people we might disagree with. Yeah. Um, we, we've got to find our way back just generally. And then again, now we're getting into social. <laughs> yeah, we are. But, <laughs> but you know, we've got to find our way back, you know, in our storytelling, but also just in general, our approach to, to each other and people we, we don't see eye to eye with on everything, mm -hmm. uh, to just being, um, being more fair minded having the ability to recognize, hey, we're not perfect either, right. and approach people in, in a kinder, more humble, and in a more optimistic way, knowing that, like you said, uh, and we've actually talked about many times, is that in the end, if we can, if we can keep a level head, mm -hmm. we will find that we have a lot more in common than we have that divides us. For sure. But uh, with that, let's get into some comic book talk right now. Actual, I mean, we've been talking about comic books, but like, you know, the stuff you read, <laughs> the actual comic books. Yeah. Uh, Batman, speaking of creative teams, uh, switching for DC Comics, Batman 86 uh, gave us a new creative team of James Tynan and uh, Tony S. Daniel drawing the book. So Tynan mm -hmm. is writing it, and Daniel is drawing it. Yep. I read issue one, and everyone knows Batman's my number one favorite character, uh, but I have to say this one was, uh, it, it kills me to say it, but it was a fail for me. Issue one. Yeah, you were pretty disappointed. Yeah, I was very disappointed. And I, I loved, you know, Tony S. Daniel and Tynan. Tynan is a fantastic writer. He's done, he did a great job of, on Detective Comics. Uh, he's done lots of great stuff for DC. He was brought up, he was uh, Scott Snyder's uh, protege. He's done a bunch of good stuff for them. Um, I, I like, he's one of my favorite writers, actually. And then Tony S. Daniel, he's like, he he's done Batman for so long mm -hmm. now. He's done so many books. He's a very popular uh, artist in the industry. So, great creative team. You bring them together. Uh, for some reason, though, it was a miss for me, and <laughs> I feel bad saying I don't. I don't like you know tearing down anyone because a lot of time and stuff went into it, and they are very good creatives. Their their work is is great, but for me personally, this book, just this particular issue again, I could pick up with issue two or three, felt a little bland to me, mm -hmm. and it was like I didn't really understand what was going on so much and i know a lot of that was because it was on purpose it was set up sure but it, you know it was to the point where i didn't understand what was going on but i also wasn't interested to find out <laughs> you know and that sounds really mean and uh, you know again this is uh, only one issue but uh as of right now i'm like oh you know i, I hope this picks up because <laughs> you know they we have like uh they're teasing the joker this is gonna be a joker story he's incorporated somehow deathstroke was in the issue uh, so, uh, Cheshire Cat was in there, so we got some things going on, and the theme of the book was, uh, apparently Batman, Bruce, is rebuilding Gotham. Yeah. He's got plans, because Alfred, because, uh, if, if, spoiler, for people who didn't know, Alfred is dead. Alfred died in, uh, <laughs> in Tom King's, uh, Batman run. He was, uh, killed. Uh, he got his neck snapped, actually. So, <laughs> spoiler, yeah, sp Alfred dead. Yeah, so, Alfred always told Bruce that, look. Batman isn't the only way you can fix the city. You are one of the most brilliant minds on Earth, if not the most brilliant mind on Earth. You could just by building, rebuilding the infrastructure and the sky, in the buildings and technology in Gotham, you could fix it like that. You don't need Batman. And it, it kind of plays with that where he's doing that now and he's kind of trying to implement plans and he's got the secret project of this uh, crazy new uh, Batmobile wing device. I forget the name. They mm -hmm. named it in the book. I forget the name of it that Lucius Fox made for him. So it's all about rebuilding, it seems. Like, that's the core of the story. Again, we're one issue in, but the first issue was very much about rebuilding. So I don't know where that's going to come in the end. Obviously, Alfred's going to come back eventually. You're mm -hmm. not, you know, you're not, you can't keep Alfred dead for long, at least, because it's Alfred. But uh, as of now, um, I will read issue two. Yeah. Uh, it's Batman. I'll give it, you know, a few more issues. Yeah, because it is really early. It is really early. So it's not... You do have to be cautious for because this sure. one issue in, and while they do, especially with a new creative team, they usually try to make the first issue come off with a bang. I will say the last issue of Tom King's Batman issue, Tinian or Tynan wrote an, an epilogue that tied into this story. Mm -hmm. like, And that was super interesting because, you know, the Joker basically says, I know who Batman is. Superman just outed right, his identity. Right. And then his thugs are basically like, you know who Batman is? What are you waiting for? When are you? That's the ultimate trump card. When are you <laughs> going to pull that? And it was basically like patience, my Padawan, patience kind of thing. So I am curious to see where this is going. Yeah. But um, So maybe I, he just needs time to stretch his legs. Yeah. So I will keep reading. But first issue, initial thoughts, I'm just like, let's get this ramped up, please. <laughs> <laughs> let's get this show on the road, yeah, gang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's fair. Um, but staying in the Batman world, out of the comic book world, Joker. Yep. Joker is nominated for 11 
Oscars. And no one is surprised. 11. It's actually uh, has the most nominations yeah. at the Oscars. It leads uh, the Oscars. It's, let's, let's go down here. Best actor. Film, yeah. We got best actor, best picture, original music score, best director, adapted screenplay, cinematography, sound mixing, costume design, sound editing, film editing, and makeup and hairstyling. Yeah. 11 freaking Oscar nominations. It's going to take home several of those for sure. And every single one is deserved. Insane. If Joaquin Phoenix does not get best actor, mm-hmm. I riot. Yeah. <laughs> now, I will say this. I saw 1917. Okay. And that movie was incredible. Do you think someone in that deserves I haven't seen it, so I can't give an opinion. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I won't get into anything because I, I do know you haven't seen it, and many in the audience probably haven't. It just came out mm-hmm. in wide release. It was one of the most masterfully crafted. This sounds like super, like, <laughs> <laughs> or, like critic-y, uh, but it, it, it was just one of the most masterfully crafted films I've seen in a very, very, very long time. We, we were talking previously. You hinted that it probably deserves best screenplay. Do you think one of the actors in it deserves best actor? No. Okay. So what I said, like for me, if I'm handing out the trophies, Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is so hard because Todd (laughs) Phillips did such a good job in every way. And and the film was so good. He wrote it and he directed it. Yeah. But after I watched 1917, my statement out loud was give Joaquin the best actor trophy and everything else to 1917. (laughs) That 1917... Uh, it's obviously not on book film or anything like that, but it was what they did with that movie. This movie from start to finish, there's only one clear cut in the entire film. I did hear it was shot to feel like yes, one constant one shot. One continuous yeah. shot. Um, there's obviously cuts, but they do it in such a way you can't see them. They're seamed, so you cannot see the cuts. Awesome. There's one time where you see a definitive cut, um, and it's just... The it's production gonna be fa- design, that's gonna be fascinating to watch. It is absolutely you are glued from from the opening frame, okay. and it allowed for this this intensity, this suspense, this uh, the le- the production design mm-hmm. is. If it doesn't get production design, I don't know what would deserve be deserving of production best <laughs> picture, uh, best production design for an Oscar, uh, because it was just remarkable. So. With all that said, uh, Joker definitely has some competition. Okay. Um, there's a lot of good movies that came out. This was actually a really good... 2019 was actually a really good year for for, for films. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of good movies that came out. Um, so 1917, for me, it, it, it was just remarkable. But Joker is right there, especially... I, I would argue... God. The, the, the best screenplay might still should probably go to the Joker. Well, it was just, I haven't seen 1917. Definitely best actor. Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't seen 1917, so I can't speak for that. But haven't seen the Joker. Uh, it, it was, again, it, we've talked about it on the podcast several times already. But it was one of, I don't remember the last time I saw a performance that I was like, like literally in the theater, I was like hitting your arm. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. What are we watching? This is crazy. Yeah. Like that, like when it was awkward and they the intent was to make you feel, you know, like, cringy or awkward or yeah. like uncomfortable yeah you felt uncomfortable as if 100%. you were in that room like oh my god what is he doing could you imagine if that really happened right like so it's hard you know you don't get movies that make you do that multiple times throughout the film yeah. often and there were so many beats you know whether it was the writing or the the pacing of the sequence and just the way everything was timed out that was like because it, it's you know it's like being a comedian like one of the hardest about being the comedian is timing. Same yeah. thing with film. Yep. Just everything was timed. The delivery. Ugh, I can't say a bad thing about this movie. You can't. <laughs> it, was, it was so good. Um, so with all that, I mean, you know, it deserves. It's deserving of the 11 nominations. No doubt. And I will also say this, even with everything I said about 1917, mm-hmm. if Joker wins everything, right, it deserves it. You'd be like, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah totally. I, yeah, I yeah. would not be upset <laughs> in everything at, in any way because it also deserves Every single nomination, and if it wins, it deserves it. It's spectacular in no, every should, way. We should okay. Let's do it now, and then we'll talk about it in the future. How many, uh, uh, how many Oscars do you think it's going to win out of the eleven? Okay, the, here's I'm just gonna. I can only base it on what like how I if I was me. Okay. So while I said best actor and then everything else in 1917, that's not really 
that's not really you were exaggerating. I was exaggerating. Right. So I, if I would really do, I would probably give Todd Phillips best screenplay. Mm -hmm. I would give Joaquin Phoenix best actor. Okay. I'd give Hilda best score because mm. her score was just incredible. That is a good one. And then all the others that Joker and 1917. So best production design, best director, best film. Those I'm probably giving to 1917. Right. But it's so close. They're, they Both of them are just such extraordinary movies and so, yeah. so, just so brilliantly made. I think I would give Joker four. I think I would do best actor, screenplay, director, and score. The score was amazing. Yeah. I mean, all those were amazing. I, that's me personally. After again. you see 1917, okay, tell me if you're, give, if you're still giving Todd Phillips or Sam Mendes. That's true. I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen it, but, you know, he I wrote it and directed it. The reason it. I say that, because, again, Todd Phillips totally deserving right, right. of that trophy if he gets it. Uh, that, but you've never seen anything <laughs> quite like 1917, the way that that was filmed. You know what? And the cinematography, dude. Both of those, cinematography, Joker, and 1917, incredible. But 1970, just for the technical aspects of the cinematography, not just the look of the film, the color palette, but the technical aspects of how they did what they did. If that doesn't get 19, well, 1970 doesn't get it. De the Deacons. What you're saying is, I have to see it. You so do I'm going to say four. You say how many? It's just so we know for future. For Joker? For Joker. How many How many wins? I'm going to say I'm gonna say it gets three. Oh, right, you're three. I'm four. We know. We, it's, it's documented for the future. But... Yeah. That's gonna wrap up today's podcast. Yeah, just that like pretty that. much covered. So much, we actually covered so much ground. We Goodness. did cover a lot of ground. But with that, guys, we'll see you next time when we talk about all things comics.